Hi, um, so I'm Lai, and my talk is going to be slightly more technical than all the other talks that have happened today so far, uh, but it's still secretly about people, so hopefully that's okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, designing artificial intelligence. Um, but first, a little bit about me, and first my cat, really, because uh, he has to appear in every presentation that I make. Um, and that's me. Um, so my name is Lai, it rhymes with pi. And I'm a grad student in computer science at the University of Washington. And down here, you can see that I'm working very hard on grad school work. Um, and what I do is I research natural language processing. I'm going to say NLP for short. Um, so if you're not familiar with what that is, um, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. And it deals with making unstructured human language more useful for computers. And I've been working in this area for about five years now. So something else that I've done uh, that's relevant to this talk is that I've made Twitter bots. Uh, so you might have seen me on Twitter as thrice dotted. Um, and when I first started doing this a couple years ago, I was completely unaware that there was already sort of an informal community like around Twitter bots, and they were connected through this hashtag bot ally. I love them. Um, and the main thing that drew me in was how friendly and welcoming and thoughtful that everyone was. Um, because it came across as this core value of the community and it extended directly into an ethos for making bots. Um, and specifically, what it is is that putting a bot out in the world that tweets autonomously does not take you as the creator off the hook. Um, it's your responsibility to design a bot that acts the way you think it should and intervene when it doesn't act correctly. So between these two worlds of Twitter bots and NLP research, I've thought a lot about social and political ramifications of AI and algorithms. And I believe that as we move forward with AI, we need to way more heavily consider ethics and care in its design. Because you can't assume that an algorithm satisfies some intention, like impartiality, by default. You always have to ask, who is it going to affect, and how is it going to affect them? And we need to design with conscious intention, because that gets reflected in our algorithms. So this is going to be a brief outline of the talk. In case you fall asleep, you won't miss anything, because I'm covering it now. Um, so first, when it comes down to it, what we call artificial intelligence just boils down to algorithms and procedures. So that isn't to say that like, we necessarily understand how to interpret what's going on inside the algorithm on a high level, um, but it does mean that there's no emergent phenomena of free will or consciousness or anything like that. It's just a computer program and it's carrying out a task that it was designed to do. This one may or may not be a little controversial. I don't know about this audience, maybe it's not. Um, so algorithms put into practice just aren't objective. Like even the implementation of a sorting algorithm is going to reflect assumptions that you've made about what the data you're sorting looks like. Um, but this is especially true for AI because you have not only the programmer's assumptions, but you have bias in training data as well. And so if you don't handle this carefully, then it can result in some dangerous machine and real world feedback loops. And finally, a mundane one after the controversial one, algorithms are designed by people. So this kind of sucks because humans are imperfect and they mess up, but it's also great because we can find points of failure and fix them. And I just want to briefly note that I'm not going to discuss any of the privacy or surveillance aspects of AI today, because that's a really huge and important topic. And I feel like if you hear ethics in AI, you might think of that. Um, but I don't have the time or expertise to cover that. Um, so on to what I will talk about. Artificial intelligence is just algorithms. So I guess what people do now when they want to see what something looks like is they Google it. Um, so that's what I did. I googled artificial intelligence, and I found out that, art that it looks like brains with circuitry. Um, OK, but really, I think that artificial intelligence is this terrible misnomer that has always carried this implication of mimicking human intelligence. 
like I, I wish instead it was a standalone modifier like dog intelligence or cat intelligence, just artificial intelligence. Cool. So like this leads to a lot of anthropomorphizing like machine processes and pictures like this and pop culture depictions of AI with sentience and you know, ideas of the singularity that's going to become smarter than humans and then kill the humans because that's what you do when you're smarter than humans. Um, but I'm not worried about that uh, because if it ever happens at all, it's definitely not going to happen soon. Um, but I am worried about what people are doing with AI in the real world right now. Um, so here are a few applications that people think of when they think of real AI, quote, quote, quote. Um, like Tay, um, like natural language agents and personal assistants that somehow end up always being gendered female, um, and chatbots. Um, but like I said, framing AI as human-ish really bugs me because it obscures the fact that you're just interacting with a computer program. And that program operates according to a set of rules that is far more brittle than the natural language that you and I use to communicate. So any notion of intelligence that we're ascribing to these programs is just our interpretation of those processes. So this is a fun example I couldn't help but include. Um, this is from the movie Her, where a man falls in love with a sentient female AI operating system named Samantha. Um, and this is a screenshot of what happens if you ask Siri uh, if she's Samantha. She says, um, her portrayal of an artificial agent is beyond artificial. So she really doesn't like Samantha. Um, but when I say Siri doesn't like Samantha, what I really mean is someone at Apple hard-coded Siri to give these responses. So it's Siri who's beyond artificial. Um, okay, so despite popular appearance, AI is not limited to things that you kind of interact with as if they're human. Um, what it is, is it's stats and it's calculus, oops, and it's an obnoxious amount of engineering. Um, so I wanna note that when people talk about advances in AI these days, they're usually talking about a particular branch called machine learning. Um, and I'm just using the term AI because it's more well known. Um, but it's called machine learning because uh, instead of hard coding rules, like in the Siri example, the computer learns rules directly from the data. Um, so from now on, when I talk about AI, I'm referring to this huge umbrella of methods that just programmatically fit functions to data and the specialized tasks that they're used for, like speech recognition or machine translation. Um, so to make things a little bit more concrete, I'm gonna quickly try to step through um, a pipeline for a common machine learning scenario. Um, so first you start with some input data which can be text or images or sound or information from a database. It can be whatever you want. Um, in order to use it, you have to kind of define like what about this data is going to be my input to the machine learning uh, model I want to make and what is going to be the output. So that's your X and Y there. So if you have text documents, you don't want to input the bytes of the raw text. You might want to split it into words or groups of words. Um, so next we pass these labeled examples um, to a machine learning algorithm and it takes the data and it attempts to create a function that maps an example, each example to the correct label. So this is a function that takes a bunch of data and returns another function. Um, and after that, um, you, get, you get a function out, and that is your prediction model. Um, so what do you do with that prediction model? Well, it's pretty straightforward because it's just a function. You get a new piece of data, you pass it to your prediction model, and then you get a prediction out. So if that's kind of abstract, um, I'll just go through a couple examples. Uh, this first one is for a chat bot because they're so hot these days. So say that you have a collection of chat logs and the speaker alternates every other line. So your set of examples is going to be each line of the chat and each line's label is going to be the line that comes after it. And you pass that to your machine learning algorithm that 
makes the function that given a line of text gives you back a new line of text. Um, and then what you get from that is a sequence generation model. You get this function that will generate text from text that you give it. It's just a chatbot. Um, so here's a more serious example. Also, I should have said this before the talk. Um, content warnings for a lot of uh, systemic racism and sexism in the examples that are going to come up. Um, so risk of recidivism. This is a thing that's used in the real world, prediction models for this. It plays a role in sentencing, parole decisions, policy interventions. So we start with information about people who have gone through the criminal justice system and label them according to whether they were arrested again after being released. Um, and then using this information, the machine learning algorithm tries to find a function to accurately predict a person's probability of recidivism. Um, so we get a function that predicts that based on the aggregated data of those who came before them. And it must be fair and unbiased because all that happened was math, right? No, no, it's not. Um, so algorithms and therefore AI are totally not objective. Um, so this is a great quote from a recent Jacobin Q&A with Kathy O'Neill, and she wrote an entire book on bias and big data called Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but I'm really interested in it. Um, so she said, machine learning has been presented to us as trustworthy because it's mathematically sophisticated and because algorithms have no agendas. But the data itself cannot be decontextualized from our historical practices, nor can the choices of the modelers who build the models and choose objective functions. Or to be even more succinct, um, my favorite tweet of the year probably, which is that machine learning is like money laundering for bias. So why does this matter? Why do we care? I mean, we probably figured that out before we got to this section. Um, but it's because we have things like racist AI beauty contests happening. We have AI that signal boosts fake news. We have AI that makes predictions in systematically racist ways. And all of that is to say that we encounter AI every single day, whether we even know it's being used or not in subtle ways that might nudge us towards reading some news article or ordering from some restaurant, um, or in larger ways that are really affecting people's lives. So Skynet's not happening, but this is happening, and I think that's scarier than that. So where, do the, where does the bias in AI come from in the first place? Um, a lot of people will just kind of throw up their hands and let's say, oh, it's the data, our data's biased. But I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. So on, on one end of the spectrum here that I made to show how complicated it is, it's one dimension of spectrum, um, there's, there's issues with data, and then on the other end, uh, there's issues with what the programmer does. So there can be problems with the characteristics or distribution of the data. There can be problems with the way that we collect or systematize that data. And there can be problems with the algorithms that are used to train the AI themselves. So these aren't mutually exclusive. A lot of the time, you can use them as different framings for the same problem, but each of them suggests a different solution. Uh, so I'm going to go into each of them. And this first one is pretty obvious. It's data imbalance. So it's when your training data is skewed towards one portion of the population over others. So you can have a model that ends up ignoring entire demographics. You end up with facial recognition systems that don't work with darker skin tones, uh, speech recognition engines that can't handle language if you're speaking with an accent. Um, and Kate Crawford, who does a lot of really important research on the social impact of algorithms, she has this example where um, if a company is using its current hiring data to determine new hires, like, if every person that that company has hired is a white male, the algorithm is going to tell them to hire more white males. Um, another danger that can arise is uncertainty bias. And that's basically this idea that an underrepresented group in the data, um, if, they, if there isn't enough data, then the model will not be confident about any prediction it makes for them. Um, 
So what this graph is showing here is an underrepresented group as a percentage of the data. The majority group, uh, this algorithm is always confident on, and the underrepresented group, it takes a long time. Like it needs, they need to be about 40% of the data to pass this threshold, um, which is important for it. So uh, next, there's implicit systemic bias, where you can't fully remove a variable that could impact the model in a discriminatory way. So for instance, if you remove race as an input, um, there are no words in that. That's weird. My words disappeared. One of those is labeled race. One of those is labeled zip code. It's meant to show that they correlate. Um, if, if you remove race as an input from the model, then that's not going to make your model not racist if zip code is heavily correlated with that. Um, so this is another example uh, from natural language processing. A popular way of representing words in AI applications is with something called word embeddings. And they're trained so that words that tend to appear in similar contexts have similar representations. And those representations are just arrays of real numbers. Um, so something that's gotten a lot of attention um, is using these embeddings for analogies. It's been this really cute result that people talk about. And what I have up here is a famous cherry-picked example uh, where man is to king as woman is to queen. So you take the representation for king and you subtract your representation for man. You add the one you have for woman and the representation you get out is close to the word queen. Uh, and people were like, that's kind of neat. Uh, and then you realize it might apply to other word embeddings too. And some researchers at Boston University and Microsoft Research actually realized this this year. So now we have another cherry-picked example that says man is to computer programmer as homemaker is to woman. Um, and this next example is one that gets me really fired up, so I had to include it. It's another uh, NLP example. So this is going to be off-put from output, sorry, from an off-the-shelf NLP system. So you just give it some text and it's going to tell you some stuff about the language. And I gave it the sentence, the programmer turned on his computer. And it does well because it's a simple example. And in particular, I want to point out the co-reference, which is saying that his means the programmers. Uh, and then I changed exactly one word and I said the programmer turned on her computer. Uh, and now, we don't have that link anymore. The computer, if you, would, if you were to ask it, it's basically saying that the programmer is turning on someone else's computer because a programmer can't possibly be a woman. And that's what it learned from the data. Um, so next we have feature representation, which is the idea that the model is going to be limited by how you structure your input and your output. Um, so a few years back, the Department of Education realized that classifying Asian American Pacific Islanders under one big monolithic category was masking significant disparities between the subgroups and it was making policy intervention difficult um, because they're trying to help under, underserved communities. Um, so I include that example because you can only find what you're able to see. And this was a case where changing the data representation, making it more fine-grained, revealed something that was completely invisible before. Um, and another straightforward example of this is with gender. So if you're assuming that gender is binary and closed classed, and you write an NLP algorithm to deal with uh, tagging text, um, then you're not going to account for pronouns that aren't he or she. So I put in the programmer turned on here computer, and we don't even know that it's a person's computer at all because it tags here as an adjective instead of a pronoun. Um, so that brings us to the objective and cost functions. Um, which is more on the programming side. And this happens at the stage of framing the problem. So what kind of prediction model are we going to try to optimize? Um, and a well-known problem in machine learning is overfitting. And that's when your prediction model performs really well on the data you trained it on, and it's garbage on everything else. So sometimes it manifests as an issue with data imbalance, like in the hiring example. So um, you train on only white males, and it's overfit to that data, and it can't deal with 
um, a job pool of more diverse applicants. But sometimes the issue is more subtle. Um, and the programmer just designs a model that over-optimizes on the data that they have to work with. And they don't think enough about the real world uh, application. And then there's the more fundamental issue of how every single real world problem that is handed to an AI algorithm needs to be recast as some kind of computational procedure or just mathematical objective. So at its core, a chatbot is just a function that is predicting a word based on the sequence of words that it's seen and the words that it's already output. And it can lead to grammatical language, but that's not a very good approximation of the human use of language to convey meaning. Um, and also, not all mistakes should be treated equally. So part of a machine learning algorithm is the cost function. And it essentially, in the cost function, you say, how much do the errors matter? Like, how much does each error that the model makes uh, how wrong is the error, essentially? Um, but different errors can mean different things. You can't weight every error equally sometimes. So this is a table from a ProPublica article that came out in May on machine bias. Um, and it was about how there was an algorithm that predicted risk of recidivism, and it was outputting racist uh, predictions. Um, so the caption reads that blacks are almost twice as likely as whites to be labeled a higher risk but not actually reoffend, and it makes the opposite mistake among whites. They're more likely than blacks to be labeled lower risk but go on to commit other crimes. And any or all of the bias sources that we've already talked about could play a role in why this discriminatory pattern occurs. But you can look at the pattern and you can realize that when the model is making different errors for different people, then some of those errors should maybe be assigned a greater cost than others. Um, so that brings us to the end of this section, which is on to my third and last point, uh, which is that algorithms and AI are designed by people. Um, so there's just one more quote that I'm going to share that I really like, and this is from a book called Understanding Computers and Cognition. And it was written 30 years ago, um, but it's still really relevant and it's been a huge influence on how I think about my approach to NLP. Um, and it says, if I write something and mail it to you, you're not tempted to see the paper as exhibiting language behavior. If I write a complex computer program that responds to things you type, the situation is still the same. The program is still a medium through which my commitments to you are conveyed. It must be stressed that we are engaging in a particularly dangerous form of blindness if we see the computer rather than the people who program it as doing the understanding. And that really gets at the thesis for my talk, which is that AI is reflective, it's not objective. Um, so it's really easy to fall into a pattern of learned helplessness if you believe that all of the factors of bad AI are beyond people's control. Like the data's impar the algorithms are impartial and the training data is biased and the humans who generate and collect the data are biased and objective functions can't perfectly approximate the world, or we just don't understand AI well enough. Because a, a machine learning model, of course, it's going to reflect the data it's trained on, but more so it's going to reflect the intentions of whoever created the model. So objective functions are not objective because they necessarily reflect your assumptions about the world and the problem that you're trying to solve. And if you're not asking who is this going to affect and how is it going to affect them, then we can tell. So a whole lot of people who are deploying AI in the world right now look like this guy. And to me, that's the guy that AI is currently reflecting and the rest of us are just edge cases. Um, but I think we can and we need to change what that reflection looks like because bias is always going to exist in some form or another in our algorithms. Um, but the bias and behavior of the AI are influenced by factors that we have control over. Um, and if you're going to naively train a model on historical data for the purpose of making predictions, um, then you're essentially creating something that's descriptivist and then you're using it in a prescriptivist way. Um, so now that AI is being used in the real world, we need to just stop making excuses, take responsibility, and design the AI with intentions. Um, 
So it's not a matter of creating perfect AI, but it's about being vigilant and catching the ways that data and our own biases can cause AI to perpetuate existing inequalities and then stepping in to fix that. Um, and there are some really concrete steps that we can take, and I'm happy to say that people are taking them. Um, and it's thinking carefully about how we sample our training data and how it's represented. Um, it's auditing algorithms for biases before putting them into use or continually doing that as they're being used. Modifying the algorithms themselves to account for data that contains systemic bias and models that are interpretable and transparent because the reasoning behind a model's prediction that could impact people's lives needs to be a lot better than the algorithm said so. So there's no time to talk about each of these, um, but I'll leave you all with this, which is that we can only fix what we acknowledge is broken. So thanks.